I have wanted to do a reconstruction of the Mary Poppins Jolly Holiday gown for quite some time. Primarily because the design that we see in the film in all its white, floofy, roughly glory, along with the outdoor setting of the scene just screams Edwardian lingerie dress, which in itself has been a project on my own personal reconstruction to-do list for pretty much since the dawn of my interest in historical costume. Unfortunately, this project has been well on the back burner of my hashtag project goals, purely because these dresses just in the images looked so complicated, so labor intensive, and honestly, really quite delicate in outcome. So this has been a wonderful one day project, not really in the forefront of my existence until now. For you see, I just so happen to now be in possession of two extant examples of Edwardian lingerie dresses, which I have been able to study. And it turns out these gowns are not nearly as complicated as I thought they were, which quite honestly, tends to be the case with a lot of historical dress. The first gown I just recently purchased earlier this year from Witchy Vintage on Instagram. The second gown was actually given to me by one of my wonderful theater colleagues. So in the process of researching and designing for my own interpretation of the Mary Poppins gown, I have had a fantastic time examining these two gowns to give me some not only design, but also construction insight into how to recreate one for myself. As is my method, I will be endeavoring to reconstruct this gown to the best of my ability as it would have been done in the period. And despite the fact that this is turn of the century Edwardian and they did have access to sewing machines, there is still a lot of handwork evident on extant lingerie dresses. And due to my current circumstances, that is being that I have zero of my sewing supplies or my studio at my disposal at the moment, I will be reconstructing this gown primarily by hand. While I will be, of course, endeavoring to incorporate only the design details, any techniques that I can find evidenced within the period. There may or may not be a couple of little details that I just borrow from the film design just to nod to that. I'm thinking most primarily in terms of the placement of the little orange ribbons, which I'm not sure we can specifically pinpoint in history. I'm going to do a little bit of digging and see what I can find. This, as with any of my reconstruction projects, is going to take a little bit of time. So today we will just be focusing on the research and design. And then I'll probably see you back here in a couple of weeks with the actual finished reconstruction process of the gown. The lingerie dress, as it is called in the period, starts to gain popularity in fashion by the 1890s and continues through to the 19-teens, with the height of its popularity occurring during the Edwardian period between 1901 and 1910. It's classified as being a lightweight, often white gown made from fine cotton lawn, batiste or voile, linen or net, and in most cases is embellished with insertion lace, pin tucks, and no shortage of frills. These gowns were intended for warmer summer wear due to their lighter weight and color and were very popular choices for outdoor events such as garden parties, derbies, and yes, magical strolls through chalk paintings. One of the most exciting things about these gowns is that there isn't one specific defining style, and in fact, the lingerie dress as a concept remains a popular garment throughout the drastic silhouette changes between the 1890s and the 19-teens. So we get to see an infinite variation in cut, skirt and sleeve shape, as well as of materials, lace placement, and amount of lace used. Simpler versions can be made with minimal insertion lace, or very rich and complex gowns can be made from very large quantities of more expensive lace. More labor can be put into stitching it all together by hand, whereas these gowns could also be machine sewn entirely by professional dressmakers as well as by the home sewer. Mary Poppins in the original novels takes her clothing very seriously and is quite in the habit of proudly admiring various new garments in her reflection as she passes shop windows. So it makes sense that her dream sequence fantasy gown would be on the slightly more elaborate side, which is precisely the excuse I need to be supremely extra with my reinterpretation. So here, just with these two gowns alone, we can already see what a diverse selection of possibilities there are with this style of gown. So this lady is actually uh, upside down. So this is the back of her with the buttons going down the back. This one here is just made out of some plain cotton with a little bit of lace insertion. But otherwise, as you can see, there's actually a little print to it, which I think is quite whimsical and adorable. This one's actually made entirely of a cotton net and because of that it's two layers so just a layer of the finest silk underneath it which again is also borderline translucent keep in mind they would have been wearing a lot of under things underneath this so she would have been wearing a petticoat as well as a corset chemise corset cover so you know you're not seeing anything indecent with these sorts of dresses but they are meant to be 
very light and ethereal. I really love this sleeve shape. This I think is earlier just because we're still coming out of the 1890s a little bit with the um, large, large, large sleeve. I should say this is an earlier sleeve shape, not that this dress is the earlier of the two because this one's actually the later of the two and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I really love the, the idea of the sleeve shape in that the top of it is very full and it sort of comes down to this more fitted cuff thing. I've seen this detail on a few of the dresses that I've been looking at online. I really love it. I really want to try and incorporate this into my edition. So as we can see, the front of this dress, so there was this fabulous trend within the like very beginning of the turn of the century Edwardian period where there's all this gathering going on at the front because they love the little like belly pooch at the front, which I think like it sounds really weird, especially to our modern aesthetic sensibilities, but it actually, I mean, it really helps to give that sort of pigeon-fronted Edwardian classic look. Um, so when you see the dresses, it looks really funny, but like when you see it on a body, it looks supremely Edwardian. That fad sort of started to disappear by the middle of the 1900s. So this dress, I would put this dress probably around 1909, maybe 1910, 1907-ish, the later part of the 1900s, maybe even a little bit into the teens. We can actually see, this is why I say this dress is the earlier of the two, because as we can see, I mean, it's got gathering all across the waist, but as we can see, there's actually more gathering going on at the front here. We can see how the front of the bodice is, it wants to sort of come out like that because it's gathered into the front quite significantly there to give it that puffy Edwardian shape. I love that shape. I think it's so cool. So I may try and do just a little bit of that on my edition because, you know, you can always backdate things a couple of years. It's more difficult to get away with looking forward. We're making a sincere attempt at historical reproduction whilst, of course, dealing with the source material of what is effectively fantasy. So I have turned her over. This is the front of her. The one thing that I find really interesting about these two gowns. These two gowns are really interesting to study side by side, but this dress is pretty much entirely uh, machine sewn. And I don't want to say that this is done in a shop by manufacturers. I have a suspicion that this is done by a home dressmaker. This is not unusual because especially amongst middle and lower class women, home sewing was very common because clothes are expensive. By the late 19th century, well, this is actually into the turn of the 20th century, the sewing machine was widely available. People could have them in their houses, and a lot of people did. In fact, Luca Costigliolo, who is one of the reigning experts in 19th century dress currently out there, he claims, and there is evidence to back this up, the prevalence of hand sewing actually increases towards the 1890s into the turn of the 20th century because the machine, it's stopped becoming novel at this point and people are reappreciating hand sewing. So there is a lot more handwork within dressmaking towards the end of the 19th century. So we can hypothesize what we will about what that means in regards to these two dresses. I think this entire thing is machine sewn. I don't think there's any hand sewing on this whatsoever, except for maybe the buttons on the back might be hand worked. There may be some like finishing work that's done by hand. But as you can see, even the insertion lace is put in by machine and not very well. I have a suspicion that this dress was made by somebody who had a lot of other things to be doing and wanted this dress, you know, wanted just a nice stylish dress done relatively quickly within her given amount of spare time. I won't say it's lazily or hastily done because as we can see, there is still all this pin tuck work up here, which it's done by machine. So like it would have been done fairly quickly. I mean, as you can see, I know people are always on about like, oh, aren't they hot in the Victorian period? Aren't they hot in all those layers? But I mean, you can literally see how lightweight this dress is. This basically, it weighs nothing. But again, you know, you've got your shaping to this gown. You would have had that classic, I, I shouldn't use the word Edwardian because that is obviously specific to the reign of King Edward in Britain. And I bought this from a vintage seller in America. Who knows where this came from? So, you know, early 20th century, just design wise, I love this little detail of the doubled cuffs, the double lace ruffles here. We'll see how much lace I have because I did buy an edging lace and I'm fairly sure I bought like 15 yards of it, but I wanna see if I can duplicate some of this detail on my gown because I love the floof effect that this gives. This is just a little design note for me. See, as I'm studying these, I'm not only making note of the techniques that I should employ in my own thing, but also getting some design inspiration because this is, I mean, it's not a direct reconstruction of an existing garment, obviously because it, I mean, it's just not. It is an interpretation of an existing not historical
historical garments, so there is a little bit of design involved, but I'm trying to make all of my design decisions within the realm of actual historical evidence. So let's have a look inside the cuff. As we can see, I love this detail here, and this freaks out my 21st century brain a little bit, just in the amount of raw edges that exist all throughout history. It makes us cringe a little bit today because our fabrics are not as tightly woven nowadays and are more just naturally prone to fraying. That's why we are particularly hyper obsessive about finishing edges today. Here is a little bit of hand sewing. It looks like there is a gathering thread having been put into there. Within the sewing instruction manuals, most of them, incidentally, the ones that I've read, don't mention machines at all. I have a sense that a lot of the straightforward techniques such as gathering would have been just naturally, intrinsically, instinctually done by hand. We can also see there is another little visible gathering thread. She never took that one out, but as we can see, this front bit was also gathered by hand. The hem on this is quite wide. Um, there's no additional stiffening in it though. It's just turned up on itself and pressed and stitched into place. It does feel, this whole dress feels very crisp, I guess. Um, I have a suspicion that this dress would have been starched because it's still got some stiffness to it. So this dress, it doesn't have the maximum amount of insertion lace that I have seen on some examples of these dresses, but this one has got significantly more lace detail than the other one. This dress, contrarily to the previous one, is actually, I would say, in the majority stitched by hand. The seam for this is stitched with a very, very long running stitch. Nope, I lie, this looks like a back stitch. So you would have to use probably a back stitch or some sort of strong stitch on a loose net like this, otherwise the whole thread's just gonna pull right out. But it's a very quick seam. They're not taking their time taking up two threads and passing over four, whatever Bertha Banner says to do. She's not doing this. Ain't nobody got time for that. To be quite honest, like what these books tell you to do is like hashtag goals of sewing, I should say. In reality, does everybody have time to do all those things? Probably not. So even the lace at the hem is stitched on by hand. They're once again, very large. And I think these are actually for reals running stitches. I think we can see again that the silk side seam is once again done by hand. And this is a running stitch. I don't think there's any back stitching to this. However, as we will notice, this hem is done by machine. So clearly she did not have time to be doing the entire hem by hand. And like, does it matter? No, no one's gonna see this. And I, I do imagine that you would want to do, because this dress does have a little bit of a train to it. So as we can see, if we look at it from above, this is, this is where her feet would be. This is the front of the dress, and then this is the train. So this bit would have been on the floor, which means that this underside is quite vulnerable. I imagine you don't want to be putting a significant amount of your time and energy into hand doing the hem that you'll probably have to take up and redo at some point in the future. Hashtag piecing is period. We can see there is some piecing excitement happening on the hem of this. I kind of love how in this period there is no expectation. Just from what I'm observing on extant garments, there is kind of no expectation for machine stitching to be like perfectly neat. So as we can see, I suspect this too is a homemade garment. This one is just done by someone who has a little bit more time and is willing to do more lace work, hand stitching and stuff. Even she's not worrying about, I mean, this hem is never gonna be seen. It's not perfectly perfect. Also, I mean, I will give her credit because this silk is the most unstable, not the most, but one of the most unstable silk fabrics. This would have been just sliding all over the place. I do not envy her this task. And uh, quite frankly, I'm impressed that it lo even looks this good. Even in the, um, for example, on the Symington bus bodice that I went to go and study last year, there was a fair bit of wonky machine stitching on that. And that was a machine manufactured garment. Obviously they did not have those super fast, super precise industrial machines that are used in garment construction today. They had manually operated sewing machines that were a little bit imperfect, just as everything sort of is. One of my colleagues, said once, and this is a phrase that I like to keep in my head. Period imperfection, before the days of everything being standardized and mechanized and automated. You know, everything's done by humans, by human hands. Nothing is perfect. And imperfection is part of history. And I think that's one of the magical things that sort of brings an element of humanity to the objects that survive to us today. So we will have to have 
a little think about the closure method. This gown here, um, because it's got this, I mean, what happened on the front is the same on the back. So it's got this center panel. It doesn't have the little waist bit in the middle. However, in order not to interrupt that, they have done a little side closure. So we have certainly this option, which I think is really clever and I will keep this in mind. See, one of the things I am seeing very frequently in the design styles of these sorts of gowns are this vertical lace bit happening here. In an overwhelming majority of the lace gowns that I'm looking at, there are right next to the neck a wide strip coming down and a wide strip coming down. Sometimes they get cut into a waist seam here. Sometimes, obviously, they, they go all the way down to the hem. And then oftentimes there are secondary lace strips. These only sort of emphasize the shoulders, but I will have a play with this on the dress form and just sort of poke around and play with the laces that I have. This dress over here, this one doesn't have the, the lace configuration for that sort of thing. As I like to say, there is no such thing as an always in history. There is no one specific way that everything was definitively done. This one closes with buttons which I also really like the idea of. And these buttons, these buttons are like a statement. They're meant to be seen. They're really beautiful. So these are thread wrapped rings, as you can see. There's a little bit of the metal peeking through on some of these, but they're just rings basically that have been thread woven. I love these so much. I think they're so clever. I do already have some buttons. They are beautiful, tiny shell buttons, which I don't have a lot of them, but I may have enough either to do one center back seam, or I may, we'll see if I end up needing buttons at the inside cuffs of the sleeve. I may not. We're gonna get to some drawing and we will make all these decisions on paper when we actually start to map out what we want to do. So one thing that is particularly different about this project that is different from my previous projects is that I don't actually know what this is going to look like before I go into it. So there's a little bit of improvisation going on. Basically what I did is because there is a lot of lace design configuration, I may or may not have done a thing where I just was on Etsy at like 11 o'clock at night and just bought a bunch of lace and thought, you know what, I will just play with it and make something nice. So I bought lots of different patterns and widths and styles of lace that I will be playing around with on the dress form just to sort of have a look and see what looks right and what looks not right and sort of figure out the design and the pattern from there. This is not how I typically work. It's a little bit stressful, but I think it's gonna be fun. I think it's gonna be a nice little breath of fresh air. So I've just played around with some stuff and got some ideas and all of these laces, by the way, are labeled with letters. I have done a little bit of prerequisite sketching, I guess, just based on some of the laces that I think go nicely together and that I like the widths of next to each other and wear on the garment. I have planned out some stuff already. So I've planned out my sleeve configuration. I have planned out a skirt configuration. This I will take and I will translate onto the actual garment sketch, you know, it's just so that I have something that I can see in full color and, you know, drawing things just sort of, I mean, it forces you to make decisions really because, oh wait, I guess I need to fill in this bit of space. So what's gonna go here? It's decision-making and it's a lot of work, but I find that going into a project, having drawn it all out first, it just helps me have a little bit more purpose going forward in the project. So I really like the drawing stage for stuff that's not reconstruction work because when it's a reconstruction obviously you have your your original garment or your original reference is basically your sketch these are the buttons by the way that i was talking about so we'll see what the rest of the closure situation looks like let us take our thoughts and our inspiration and our newfound research knowledge let's go draw this out and let's see what we come up with So this is going to be a particularly interesting project, I think, because although all the design elements are based in history to the best of my capability, I do still get to have some personal opinion here. And personal opinion states that I love a poofy sleeve. So naturally the first decision I made here was to give this gown that fabulous turn of the century fitted forearm with the gloriously drapey upper bit. Yes, fitted sleeves were also common on Edwardian lingerie dresses and the sleeve on the film Jolly Holiday dress is a slim one, but I don't really care. 
As with all of my projects, I do like for them to have more than one purpose, and on projects such as this that aren't meant to be direct historical reproductions, I like for them not to be just a costume, so I do think I will potentially be able to get some real-world wear out of this, and this I will be entirely more tempted to do if the dress has gloriously poofy sleeves. Self-justification complete, the skirt design is going to be an alternating pattern of insertion lace, pin tucks, and gathers. The two gowns I've looked at in person are actually relatively simple at the hem, but a lot of the examples I've seen online, especially the particularly schmancy ones listed on old auction pages, could be super, super elaborate at the hem, so I'm going to give this a bit of a go. I did see one gown that had scalloped a row of insertion lace, which I think I'm going to try and replicate here so that I have a nice, verifiably period detail to make the placement of the the little orange skirt bows on the film dress actually make sense. I've replaced the waist cinch thing on the dress in the film with a wide satin sash here, since we do see these sashes very frequently on existing lingerie dresses. The sort of Swiss waist thing she wears in the film was common in the 1860s, but I personally haven't seen evidence of these remaining in popular fashion much into the second part of the 19th century, let alone into the Edwardian period. So as nice as it looks in theory, we're going to opt instead for something with a little bit more contemporary documentation. In addition to the insertion lace, since I'm not making the whole entire gown out of just pieces of lace, although that's not a terrible idea, I've also bought some nice cotton voile, which is slightly heavier than the super sheer cotton lawn I've used in previous chemise à la reine endeavors. It's lightweight enough just to be barely translucent without being completely transparent, similar to the cotton gown example. Now that we've got the design settled, I'm feeling pretty confident in knowing how to move forward with this project. There's about to be a whole lot of fiddly lace sewing going on in the next few weeks, so I shall see you back here sometime around the beginning of April with a video on the reconstruction process and, of course, a reveal of the final gown. In the meantime, we shall be here with regularly scheduled historical dress investigations and light-hearted tomfoolery, so I shall surely be seeing you anon. For projects such as this jolly holiday dress, or this entire channel as a whole, the sewing is just the surface of the iceberg. As you've seen in this video, drawing and painting skills were integral in helping me to solidify my ideas and to make a plan. The fact that we are sitting here together at all is a result of the cocktail of cinematography, storytelling, editing, search engine optimization, and online marketing skills. All of these skills and so many more can be learnt on Skillshare, the online learning community built for creators with thousands of classes in everything, from practical creative skills to business management and even lifestyle classes to help you be more productive and optimize for ideal creative performance. Back in September, I took a course called How to Be Happier, Stoicism for Modern Times by Ali Abdal featuring Sam Ahmed. This course is perhaps single-handedly responsible for helping me to learn to face my work with a much healthier outlook. In this introduction to the ancient philosophy of Greek Stoicism, the most important thing I came out with is learning to identify what it is I can control in my life. That is, only my own thoughts and actions and not the traffic outside the window. Not my subscriber count, not how other people choose to consume and respond to my work, but I can control the effort I put into my content, the quality and frequency with which I work, and how I choose to contribute to the world. So whether you are looking to fend off boredom with the power of learning, to turn your skills into a business, or to just get involved with a community of fellow passionate creators, I definitely recommend Skillshare for all your learning needs. The first 1,000 people to use the link in the description box below will get a free trial 
of Skillshare Premium Membership. After that, it is only around $10 a month.